to be reminded in the days in which we live, we need to be reminded as to, as to how to be, both as, as husbands and wives, but as kids, fathers, all these things, workers, people that have jobs that work for people. And so I want to read the entire text in its entirety. I don't usually do this, but I know lately I have not had enough time to finish. So I want to make sure that we uh, put it all in context. Verse 18, wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, give your bond servants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving, meanwhile praying also for us, that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains, that it may, uh, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. There is a lot in there. We're not going to be able to to really break down every single verse, but there's enough of a homework assignment, no matter where we find ourselves, whether you're a kid, whether you're an old person, a young person, you don't have kids, you're married, you're divorced, whatever the case is, there's enough in here for all of us to look at and go, okay, what he's trying to give us in so many ways, and Ephesians expounds on this, is if you're a Christian, your household should be different period. It should not mimic the world. It should not be like the world. It should not be, well, but my but my neighbors do this and they watch this movie and they're not that bad. It's, it's a standard all its own. It's the Christian home. And I know that means a lot of things in the society like this, where you have teachings that are online and everybody in the whole planet can see them uh, literally real time as they go out. But I'm going to start and we're going to spend the majority of our time on the first four verses but we are going to hit all of it. But I want to set it up. This is once again how things ought to be. It is not how we find things a lot. We don't find ourselves super, uh, like without Christ, we find ourselves craved. We find ourselves with tons of sin. With Christ and in Christ, if the Spirit of God is, has regenerated our, our spirit and is uh, keeping us and convicting us, we should be different. Now, we might have a long road, and we might really mess up a lot. But if our heart is the kind of heart that when this type of a passage is read, you go, yes, I want that. Or if your heart isn't right, you stiff arm the passage and go, well, that's just your opinion. Necessarily aspire to the Bible being an authority. Or, you know, that's those are really nice things. You, you can you can possibly hear when as it pertains to how the family should look in 2022 in America. It does, but it's is it possible that maybe just maybe a controversial passage like this one is it possible that in the culture we're living in right now that it's upsetting to people for a couple of different reasons. One reason, one huge reason is. It's because God having a standard that I can't naturally in my own power live up to makes me mad, makes me frustrated, makes me indicted, makes me realize I need something outside of myself to finish this life. And I don't necessarily like that because I want to do it my way. And and outside of Frank Sinatra, who did it his way, um, the people of God can't do it their way. They have to do it the way Christ wants it. And so when we fall short, we ask for help. When we fall short, we confess, we admit, we say the same thing. God, you're right. 
I missed the mark on this one. So that's one reason why people really, really don't agree to, oh, this is how things ought to be. Well, I don't know. It's not 1944 anymore, Dan. Okay, I'm telling you the Bible has always been the Bible. This, this letter is almost 2,000 years old. So it's, we're not talking about, well, things got a little, whoa. Things got a little progressive. Wait, people have struggled with this. Even in times where maybe divorce wasn't as prominent as it is, families were jacked. Families were messed. It just didn't get, there's no press. There's no cameras to report it. There's no social media to throw it out there. But it was messed up. It's always been messed up. Man has been messed up since day one, since the first day that, that man sinned. We know from scripture that the enemy has always tried to destroy Christian marriage. True Christian marriage. Biblical Christian marriage. Why? Because he despises and opposes every single thing that God says, but specifically anything that God establishes. If God makes something, Satan tries to wreck it. He's like the angry little kid after the sandcastle that was disciplined at the beach, and he just walks all over it and smashes it. And then God builds another one, and he smashes it. Why are you smashing that? Because I didn't build it, and I'm not getting enough attention, and I'm a big baby. Well, there's some attributes to Satan that are a lot like that. But that is, that is another reason. But there's also, in our day, there's just so much hurt. And people go, is this even possible? Is it possible to have a home that where a wife truly says, I love my husband so much, I'm going to let my husband lead. I, I'm, I'm called to let my husband lead. Let's dive into this. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting to the Lord. In a million ways, our society hates this verse about as many. Uh, I mean, in terms of the verses, the thousands of verses, top five. Society hates this. Why? Many reasons why. Feminism, which which in our day and age is so prominent that it's they 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 read this and they only see one thing: a wife a wife is going to get crushed if she does this. Therefore, we will not do this. Therefore, we will not submit. Okay. Once again, we're not talking about. Did I just get struck by lightning? What just happened? I just saw something spark over here. The building's not grounded very well. Um, I don't. It's very interesting that happened after I read this. Um, this is fitting. Uh, they don't like it. They don't like it. My wife's watching from online. I'm just kidding. Um, but it's important to establish that the scripture teaches that there is an order. And maybe your house is out of order. But there is one. It still exists. Even if you're not following this. Even if you're going, well, we don't really subscribe to that. There is still an order that God set. Unfortunately, true Christian homes seem to be this few and far between. This seems to be rare in what, 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 what America might call Christian households. Whatever that means to the rest of them. Oh, that family, they go to church someplace. Well, church generally, that word generally implies something Christian something loosely evangelical more than not if someone says well yeah i go to mass like five times a week you're probably not talking about a bible church you're probably talking about a catholic church when i'm talking about christian homes this is rare in christian homes we're not we're not even thinking we're going to find this outside of christianity we're not believing that we're going to find this but we need to understand that as far as god is concerned there is an order to christian households as for the word submit, I want to read the Greek words because there's a lot of weird translations in 2022. There's a lot of strange ones. There's some woke ones that have come in that have been rewritten and just words have been changed. Any word that would like kind of funnel us into like a standard is like, like it's like a noodle. It's like, uh, sort of, maybe not so much. Uh, wives, uh, be nice to your husbands-ish. Colossians chapter three, verse 18. Not the translation we want. However, we're going to read this Greek word because of this, uh, these, these translations. Um, I'm going to butcher the translation because my Greek is horrible, but I believe it's um, hupatasso. The word was a military term, and it meant to arrange troop divisions. That's this word. That word submit in English is that word I just read, uh, that I just butchered. To arrange troop divisions in a military fashion under the command of a leader. In non-military use, it was a voluntary attitude of giving in, cooperating, 
assuming responsibility and carrying a burden. Now, I think most people would disagree on so many things in our culture, but I do think that most people would agree that the United States military needs to have order. I think most people would agree with that. I don't think it offends them because even though there are military people of every of every creed, of every race, of every religion in our military, there are, I think most of them buy in to, well, yeah, of course, there's a general. If you ever get to be in the, in the room with a general, you better show some respect. Even the privates know this. They know this. Lieutenants, majors, colonels, all over all of the armed forces, I think even the average American would be like, well, it's probably a good thing, right, to have some kind of order. I think if you asked people, hey, should the military just be a bunch of people who do whatever they want on the battlefield, whenever, wherever, however, is that going to be a great outcome? Probably not. It's probably going to be beyond messed up. So once again, this word um, that in the order of a, of a general or, or a, an admiral or whatever, I think you have voluntary submission. I think you have people that go into the military outside of the draft in the past 50 years or whatever it's been since the draft ended, people voluntarily put themselves under this authority. Millions, with millions of people since 1970, whatever, three, I don't know when the last year they, they drafted people was. It was before my time. And I think they go, they, you know that you're going to be asked to do stuff. You know that if a, if a person asks you to do something that you go, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. You know this. This is not, this is not abusive to, to go into that. Um, and, and I used to hear this uh, in churches. I used to hear some of the rougher preachers preach this. And the husbands would be like, you see? Submit. It's like, oh, hold on, brother. Verse 19 is for you. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Once again, the command here is to love without condition. Who loved like that? Let me think. God Almighty. Jesus Christ came and gave himself for his bride, the church. Anyone that would come and accept him as savior, he, he didn't say, well, you got to clean your life up first. Well, you're a little outside of who I can save. My father said, if people are within this framework, they can come. You know, all people he gave his life for all that would come. Agapeo. I think you guys know what that Greek word translates to. It's agape love. It's one of several, four specific Greek words that we use love for as like a wild card now. That word just is ruined, to be honest with you. Um, but this this one, agape, is one of several words. Uh, it is used in the Bible to talk about a pure, willful, sacrificial love, sacrificial husband's love that intentionally desires another's highest good. If men, you know, we have this, like the whole fighting the chicken and the egg thing with men and women, uh, and TV shows and sitcoms and the and the like. Um, nobody's marriage, no matter what, nobody's marriage is even close to perfect. Best ones that you've ever known have had trouble. Um, but when you look at who is willful, pure, sacrificial, and intentional and wants the best, when you look at a general that would be like that or an admiral that would be like that, people will die for that guy. People will do anything for that guy because of the type of command, because of the concern, because of the love. Positions are irrelevant. God's going to hold everybody to account for their position and show no favoritism. So the, I think the least in the kingdom of um, the earth, Jesus is like, hey, you're going to be blown away. The kingdom of heaven. John the Baptist, I mean, I always call Paul the all-star of the New Testament. But Jesus said, John the Baptist is the best one that's ever been born of a, of a woman. And, and he is not going to be what you think in the kingdom of heaven. There will be others that are, are esteemed higher. Oh, that's kind of that's crazy. Desiring another's highest good. So do not be bitter toward them. That's the love. That's the level of love. That's the, once you perfectly nail that, husbands, me too, specifically me. I always preach first to me. Then we can say, hey, how about a little submission? Once you're on par with Jesus Christ and you got his life track record, then you can call your wife in for a meeting and say, how about the submission thing? Okay, so in other words, you're never going to get to. So this word bitter in the Greek translates to bitter. 
Literally. This is the best translation word I've got. Literally, we have a perfect translation for once, English to Greek. English is so, it really, really lacks uh, in the New Testament. Uh, but when husbands are not loving their wives in this pure and sacrificial way, there can uh, a, a heart and a root of bitterness can sneak in so fast, and it almost always sneaks in when you don't see it. It almost always is like a, it, it's like it's like this overnight growth of, whoa, where did that come from? So we got to guard against it. But once that happens, it's very difficult to restore the relationship. Once a husband is aggressive and bitter and all these other things, it's very there's so much work to get that back, to get back the sort of the, the equilibrium or the or the confidence of the relationship because there's been so much. And we we know, guys, we live in a society where seven out of ten marriages fail, and less people now are getting married. We're in a birth rate decline. Uh, America wide, like all of America, like we're declining. Uh, natural citizens are declining in huge numbers right now, and people are not getting married. Doesn't I mean there's no children being born, but I'm talking about a Christian household. So when husbands love their wives the way I just talked about with this uh, agapeo, the environment of the home is a blessing. It's a safe haven. It's a wonderful place for children to be born. Doesn't mean that there will be children. We're talking about husbands and wives right now. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Children do need to obey their parents, it's true. And parents need to instill right and wrong in their kids. They need to teach them about God from a young age. They need to be like very, very intentional about teaching kids at a young age about Christ because uh, kids do not have to be taught. I know this will be shocking for you. They don't actually have to be taught to rebel. They don't. It's so natural. I was arguably the most rebellious kid of the 80s in America. Um, I could have I could have definitely placed first, second, or third in that. Um, and I, I nobody ever taught me to be like that. I just was one of those guys who's like, I'm gonna I'm gonna put my own path, I'm gonna do whatever I want. Uh, I'm in charge. My mom actually texted me. Um, I don't remember, but when Reagan was shot, some guy said that. Uh, when Reagan's not a, uh, around, I'm in charge. But it wasn't the vice president. I don't remember who this guy was. Uh, she threw it out there. She's like, this was a thing when you were little. She goes, you were probably watching uh, the media replay that. And you said, well, I'm in charge. That sounds good. Um, I told the story of when my parents were gone and my grandparents uh, were there. They told me to go to bed early and turn the TV off. I went back, turned it back on and said, no, when my parents aren't here, I'm in charge. I think it was five. Might have been, Might have been six. So that's where that came from. But he, she, she told me I probably didn't come up with that originally. There's no original. I mean, what's, what, what kids do, a million other kids have done. But scripture teaches us to hide God's word in our hearts so we don't sin against God. That's for all people. But specifically, we, we want to teach kids, not only the gospel when they're young, but we want to teach them that there's consequences, that there is right and wrong, because the second they get into a public government school, that will be erased. It's just a fact, uh, especially at the university level. Obviously, we don't need to teach. We need to be teaching kids a biblical worldview as well, like how the family should operate. And we should be doing our best to continually sharpen our witness as husbands, as wives, for our kids. But there is a real need for parents to set the right example. Even if there's been divorce, even if there's a fracture in the family, even if there's just, hey, two people have a kid together. If they're Christians, they need to treat one another with respect. They need to do these things. They need to be respectful and loving. And, and the, the child's mother needs to respect the, the position the father has and vice versa, even if they're not together. To say, wow, even though there's been a, there, there's been a, a mistake or there's been a hurt or there's been a fracture or whatever it is, God can bring beauty out of ashes. God can make anything restored. He can, and he does. But also, we, we need to teach our kids that God does hold people to account. Verse 21, fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Um, why he would write this? Uh, because fathers provoke their kids. Because when they feel, when when fathers feel maybe uh, slighted or, 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 uh, whatever the disrespected or whatever it is. Um, the, the tendency is to like, you, like to snap and be like authoritative and be harsh. 
I have done this many, many times. Uh, and it's horrible. Uh, and it's not biblical. And, we, and I need help from my Father uh, in heaven. And I, and, and I trust that I'm not the only one in this room that is in this camp. But we, we don't want them to be discouraged. We don't want them to, to feel like the Bible isn't God's word. And when they feel like everything's a mess, my family's a mess, my dad doesn't do what he's supposed to do, my mom doesn't do what she's supposed to do, but we go to church, everybody acts, acts like everything's good, and it's not okay to talk about real struggle. We've tried to cultivate that here, that, that Dan and I are, are, are a mess, work, in progress. We've tried to, like, I, I, if I've ever given the impression that we are not struggling just like everybody else, I apologize because that is not the case, but we have a standard to go after. And so um, with authority comes accountability. You get to be uh, a husband and a wife, maybe. Maybe if you're a husband and wife, maybe in a Christian home, maybe you bring children into it. And that's a big deal. And that's something that you should pray through if you're not there yet. Because children are the greatest thing in the world, but but it, you you also need to be ready for it. You need to be ready for what you're, what you're um, signing on for as it pertains to accountability. So there, um, when there's a military operation, to get back to the military thing, that goes south, the discipline f- comes to the higher-ups first. Um, if the president uh, orders an operation, um, the guys that are on the ground floor, they don't get yelled at by the president. The general does. Hey, what happened here? We were sitting in joint chiefs. We were sitting in a meeting, and you said this was a 90% chance we were going to get this done, and you, you messed it up. And, it's, and you're resigning. I want your resignation. The Navy SEALs don't get, they don't get fired. Their boss gets fired. So when you and I bring children uh, into this world, God holds me responsible for the kids. He doesn't hold somebody else responsible for those kids that has a great relationship with them. Me. It's a huge deal. Fatherlessness and deadbeat dads in America might be a bigger epidemic than drug use. I mean, if we were really actually covering like what really goes on in this country, we, we could see that so many kids haven't been uh, fathered properly, that they might have a biological father, but who has been a father to them? It's a huge deal. Because of how God designed the heart of a child, fathers have this huge impact over their kids. They must be careful not to frustrate and discourage. They must be approachable. They must be somebody that a kid can come to and say, hey, you know, I have this, I have this issue I want to talk to you and not feel like they're going to get punished for saying that. Uh, 20, uh, verse 22, bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, for there is no partiality. So much in there, but obviously slavery, bond servants, let's translate that to job. You work for somebody, in theory. Uh, most people work for somebody. Um, I think back to my many, many jobs when I was let's say 18 to even earlier, 18-ish uh, to maybe 23. I had probably 15 jobs. I would just get bored with the job and I would just be like, eh, it's like a lily pad. I just jumped the next one. And I really, um, I really struggled with this if I didn't like the guy who was over me or the girl that was over me. And there was one job, and I, I, I got to be careful because these videos now are taped. There's enough people in the Facebook post that know exactly what I'm talking about if I talk about a specific job, but I will just say this. I will use a sentence that was said. So one day I wasn't at work and a buddy of mine was working at the same company with me and uh, I have to be really careful about this. So the, the boss was, let's say, absentee. We'll just use that general word. He did not uh, come to work a lot. Let's just say that. Um, and so I started to kind of look at that and be like, you know what? I deserve a little bit of that. I don't know where this entitlement comes from in life. Like we just, America, one of the greatest things about America is that you can you can work really hard and make something, but there's so many ways to sort of just 
skate through life and just kind of get by and not really have to hustle like you see when you go on a mission trip to a third world country where there's no extra resources. Or in their day where there was no there was no entitlements, there was no social security, there was no pensions. So anyway, so a, uh, an employee says something to one of the one of the managers at this company and he goes, uh, so uh, you came to the company through Dan and he goes, yeah, he goes, Dan's a good guy. He does kind of skate on me a little bit, but I put up with it because he shows up so much. And when he told me this, he was kind of laughing. Like my buddy was kind of proud. He's like, he goes, yeah, he goes, you can kind of get away with stuff. And I was like, I don't think that's the best thing biblically. I was going through, like I was at Bible college or, or like right out of Bible college. I can't remember the, the summer it was, but I was like, ooh, verse 25. But he who does wrong um, will be repaid. Obviously, verse 22, as employees, it doesn't matter if you are uh, an actual like W-2 hourly employee or you work remote or you're the boss or you own your own company or whatever it is. God gives us X, whatever that is. He gives to some one talent. He gives to some 10 talents. We are supposed to cultivate those gifts for his pleasure. Like we are supposed to work as onto Jesus. That we are working when the boss leaves town, when the boss leaves for the day, the work does not stop from four o'clock to five o'clock. It's tough sometimes. It's tough for people to to work like he's still watching them. And I think what I would what I would remind us of is when we read verses like this, that you have to sort of envision that Christ is sitting on on in the boss's seat, staring at you. How would you work if Jesus literally walked through the door or the boss walked through the door with Jesus? You'd work harder. You'd work on to the Lord. And so whatever I do as an employee, do it heartily as I'm working toward the Lord. Why? Because you are if you're a Christian. You work for the Lord. You are work, working on to the Lord. You may be working for Coke. You may be working for Amazon. But you're because of who you are as a person in Christ, People around you are going to notice a different work ethic. Guys, I think we can talk about the work ethic in 2022. I've talked to a lot of business owners. It is a low bar. You can rise to the top at companies these days like never before. You can get jobs. I mean, I had a 14-year-old kid that is working for a wage that is staggering to me because of the pandemic, because no one wants to work. It's it's un- incredible. The opportunities right now um, and the hourly wages that are out there because they need human beings. They need people that will show up when they say that they're going to show up. I was talking to a guy who who is a manager of a, over 200 employees. He goes, 66% of my employees call out at least once a month. 66 out of 100 call in. I go, I don't remember calling in sick in the, in the late 90s. I don't remember doing it. I showed up because my boss, one of my bosses was like, you show up sick, I don't care. You get people sick. I don't care. You're all coming in sick. Unless there's vomit, get here. Okay. So that's the bar is vomit. Bucko three on the forehead doesn't work. Okay. I got you. I'll be here. Um, but I needed money. So I was like, ah, oh, whatever. But I was I was taught work from guys that worked old school. So it wasn't that difficult. But masters, verse one of chapter four, masters, give your bond servants what is just and fair knowing that you also have a master in heaven. If you're a Christian boss, your employees should love that about you. Good. It's not always the case. I mean, a real Christian. Once again, we've talked about the faux Christianity in this country, the amount of people that identify as Christian. That number is lower than it's been in a long, long time, but it's still over 60%, guys. 60 out of 100 Americans say that they're Christians. Now, we know that that's not Christian 60 out of 100 following biblical protocols. But we do know that maybe loosely, hey, at Christmas time, if I was to go to church with a gun to my head, I would go to a Christian-ish church. That's why I'm Christian. Okay, I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about you who come to hear God's word proclaimed each week. If you are a boss, pay somebody what's just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven and God's going to hold you account the verse before that, there is no partiality. God doesn't go, oh, oh, are you connected somehow to one of the original disciples? Oh, are you Jewish? No, there's no back door to heaven. 
There's no like, oh, well, God's grading on a curve. You guys remember that? The curves? I loved the curve. I struggled so much in school that grading on the curve was my savior to get through classes like geometry and chemistry specifically. And I remember specifically a couple of classes when I was like taking the pulse of a Monday morning bad grades across the board, all 30 something we have red pens, C minus, B minus are the highest grades we're seeing. I'm like, thank God. Oh, this is going to be good for me. Uh, because my F now translates to a C minus, I'll probably pass the class. The grading on the curve does not exist in Christianity. Um, once again, I don't even know if, if teachers do this anymore. But the curve is a wonderful thing if you're in college or in high school and you have a bad class. There is no such curve in spirituality. There is no backdoor. There is no uh, plus ones. There's no guest list. It's, hey, whatever God gave you, take it seriously. If God's given you the ability to, to manage tons of stuff, manage it well. If God's given you the ability to uh, drive a truck, drive that truck well. Drive that. I've seen so many truckers with like tons of witness stuff over my life, like my whole life. One of the most successful people that I know of is a guy who started with one truck, and now I think he has... I don't know, over a thousand. He is a super, super awesome Christian man, lives in Florida, um, started this business in his basement 40 something years ago. He, it, everywhere you meet this guy, no matter where you go, you know he is a Christian. There it is again. Um, shocker. So, masters, give your bond servants, and I know this on, I have this on good authority that his employees love working for that company. God has taken one truck and turned it into over a thousand and turned like a small living, great household on so many levels, great kids. It was a guy who took this passage super seriously. I didn't see a lot uh, growing up in a church. This was one that he did it about as good as you can do it. He paid people well. He paid them fair. He was good and he was benevolent to his employees. That's how we want to be if we're bosses. Somewhere in here, you find yourself. You're at least a child, minimally. You at least have parents or had parents. Um, but some of us are a lot of these things. Some of us are children of parents, husbands, fathers, bosses. Some of us are a lot of things in here. So we have a, we have a, we have a, a large, long list of things to look at here. Finishing up, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Being vigilant with prayer. It's, it's a verse that we often can kind of just go, oh, yeah, 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 be prayerful. Yeah, be prayerful. But we, we really do need to um, make sure that that's how we would describe or someone else would describe our prayer life, maybe even how Jesus would describe it. Meanwhile, praying also for us, uh, Paul and his, and his boys, that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. So walk in wisdom toward those who are outside. Redeem the time. We don't have, guys, whether or not you we, God tarries and waits a long, long time and all of us die a natural death, we don't have tons of time left. Just by definition, time in terms of eternity. Redeem the time. Use what time you do have to bring glory to God and for God to go, hey, good job with that. Well done, servant, with that time, what you did. No matter what you are in this life, you could have nothing in this life and a vigilant, aggressive prayer life. And God will go, well done, good and faithful servant. You have done a lot with a little. I'm going to put you over much. So God's going to say to who we think is like, well, they can't really do much in this life. Maybe not in this life, according to you, but God is going to give that person a place that, that a lot of people would, would probably covet. Um, how we walk towards outsiders, how we are towards outsiders. Our witness is huge. Let those who know you and describe you that are not in the faith go, well, I know one thing about him. He's pretty serious about Jesus. Or she's pretty serious about her faith. I know that about him. Let that be said about you and us. Let your speech always be with grace. Fathers, wives, mothers, husbands, gracious speech, seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer each one. A couple things in closing. For those that hear this message and are looking for an excuse for their behavior, though there is not one, if that behavior is bad, 
The culture will give you many, as many as you can find. The culture will tell you every single thing, polar opposite to what I just said, to what I just read. God is not mocked. God does keep a score, and God will deal with all people according to the measure, and only he knows how much measure there is, because only he sees the heart. Secondly, Christian conduct, wherever you find yourself in these scriptures that we've covered, whoever you are in these many, many roles, it's very important now more than ever than that we obey these commands and that our lives shine bright to the outside world. Because our witness right now shouts like a megaphone. When you do this and you do it with grace, it shouts like a megaphone. It doesn't mean people are going to be like, oh, that's awesome. I, I love your little 1930s life. It doesn't mean that people are going to think it's great. They're going to notice it. And then that conviction is going to make, it's going to kind of provoke a behavior from there. Hey, this is what God says. How do you, how do you uh, act? Or how do you, what do you think about that? Well, I think you're kind of old school. I think you're kind of a little too uh, reactionary or conservative or whatever it is. And you say, look, politics aside, whatever you think, I'm trying to do Colossians 3 properly. So, like, hey, let's talk about that. Let's talk about what God says. You will be shocked with how much, when your Christian conduct mimics chapter 3 and 4, you'll be shocked at how many people, witness, and they just kind of double take. They just kind of go, are you serious? Um, you will be shocked at how many people um, have something to say. I mean, I've had people say stuff to me. Uh, I think they're just shocked that me and Shannon, like all of our kids are ours. I think that's like, we're like weird now. Um, that's the tide. If somebody came to this church, she goes, is he the father of all of them? And Shannon goes, yeah. She goes, that is so cool. Like what a concept, God. Like you think that's cool. That's right here. That's, that's God's word. God invented the family. He came up with the family. It was his idea. These are not things that I came up with or I just, oh, well, I think, you know, women should do this or the husband should do this. This is God's word, man. So for those that hear this message and they, and they kind of, they're kind of just like, wow, like I, I want to rally around that. Rally around it. Petition the Lord. Go at him. He's the one that Christ's life. We, we talked about that three weeks ago. Christ's life, the Spirit of God regenerating will make you and I be able to come towards this. We cannot come towards this in our own uh, power. Amen. Let's pray. We are over again. Uh, Father God, uh, we, we just thank you for um, loving us, God, for preparing a way, for making a way, God, when there was no other way. And Lord, we know that uh, we fall short. Uh, Romans tells us that we all fall, fall short um, of your glory, of your standard. Um, but because of Christ, we can not only live, that we can join you one day and we can live with you in heaven one day. God, I pray that you would encourage us. I pray that you would bring us toward your standard. Um, if we're uh, wayward or if we're uh, way off or our compass is off, Lord, that we would be restored, that we'd be brought back, brought into confession um, to the true north. And God, once again, we thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen.